Today, we're turning kitchen waste and leftover soil amendments into gold for your garden? Well, not literally, though I'm sure you wouldn't mind gold nuggets appearing in your garden. I'm not so sure if it's the same for your soil. We'll go over how to make a high quality organic fertilizer using stuff you'd normally toss out. So let's transform that food waste and leftover materials into a nutrient rich living plant and soil food. The primary ingredients are leaf mold, wood chips, pumice, and starter castings. We'll also be including additives for an extra boost, such as azomite, biochar, alfalfa meal, and kelp meal. Don't worry if there's anything you don't have. We'll go over alternatives and why each material is important, so you can come up with your own solutions if you want to get creative and experiment. And if you'd rather just buy everything, the components are all available on our website at austinwormlab.com, if not in your local gardening store. First, you're going to need a container. And this is what we process all of our worm castings in. It's a grassroots living soil fabric pot. And what makes this fabric pot different is its plastic woven liner. It allows oxygen flow while still able to retain moisture. One of the problems I was running into with regular fabric pots is the edges get dry very quickly. And this has been a big game changer in retaining moisture while still allowing oxygen flow, which is important for healthy microbial populations. You can of course use most plastic containers like totes, buckets, or other worm systems. This has just been my favorite container to use while trying to create the best environment for not just worms, but for a diverse spectrum of microorganisms. Now that we have a container, what do we put in it? Let's start with the bedding. For a portion of our base or bedding, I like to use leaf mold compost. For those of you who don't know, leaf mold is a compost that just consists of, unsurprisingly, leaves that have gone through a decomposition process. Unlike common composts broken down through a thermophilic process using heat and bacteria, leaf mold is broken down from a colder process using fungi, which in turn you're left with a more fungal dominant material with micronutrients such as nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium that are available to your plants and soil. It's got a great structure, it's fluffy, rich in carbon, it also rivals peat moss and moisture retention. And you can, of course, make your own. It's just going to take some time. If shredded to bits, the leaves can take about six to eight months. If they are whole leaves, the process can take about one to two years. And also given a shady area and some moisture. For the next portion of our base, I use wood chips. Most of us don't have piles of wood chips laying around. So a hardwood mulch found at your local nursery will do just fine. I love wood chips for multiple reasons. It can be free. You can call local tree trimming or arborist companies and schedule a drop off of chipped wood. With the addition of the leaf mold compost, we are trying to almost emulate a biome of a fertile forest floor. This is a carbon rich material and fungi love carbon. With this system, we are trying to achieve a fungal dominant vermicompost. Why is because fungi breaks down more complex materials whereas most bacteria break down more simpler substrates. The fungus unlocks an array of available essential nutrients for your plants and soil. Next, we're adding roughly 5% pumice, mostly for aeration. It's very porous and has a lot of surface area for air and water to pass and hold onto. These pockets also provide space for microbes to propagate and occupy. You can use other materials for this, but I like pumice because you can reuse and cycle them from bed to bed or pot to pot. Just sift it out and remix it. This method is also super cool because you're adding inoculated pumice to your plants and pots, essentially transferring the beneficial microbes throughout all your gardening containers. Pumice also doesn't really break down, unlike perlite, which is used for the same purpose. However, using perlite, you miss out on the ability to reuse it for many years. So this is why we love pumice. Lastly, for our bedding, we're going to add our super inoculant, about 20% of some older leftover material from one of our bins that we've harvested our castings from. This is a great way to kickstart your system in giving the substrate sort of a culture that has already been worked through and started the mesophilic decomposition process. Mesophilic, in opposition to the thermophilic composting I mentioned before, is an aerobic microorganism driven decomposition of organic matter at low temperatures. You can take some material from the older system to seed the new system with microbes, or you can add worm castings as a substitute. Keep in mind, this isn't the most simplistic form of a vermicompost system, but we are trying to create an environment for a variety of microbial life. For a simpler approach for bedding, paper, cardboard, or coconut coir are all very easily obtained and great sources of carbon that fungus love. You don't have to use a starter or worm castings, it just inoculates the system. 
So it saves time as opposed to having to wait for your micro population to grow and establish. For our first amendment, we're going to add azomite or rock dust. Azomite is a natural mineral supplement derived from volcanic ash. It's used as a soil amendment to provide a spectrum of trace minerals. And in your worm bin, it's also providing grit necessary for your worm's digestive system. This can also be done with crust eggshells or cornmeal, but azomite contains elements like iron, zinc, copper, manganese, and others. These minerals can contribute to the overall nutritional content of your worm castings and pass to your garden and soil. Next, we're adding a small amount of biochar. Just like pumice, biochar is also porous and can absorb and retain water. Biochar acts as a sponge for nutrients, preventing them from leaching away when watering. This helps keep essential minerals and nutrients in the bedding, making them more accessible to plants over extended periods of time. Our next amendment I like to add is alfalfa meal. Alfalfa meal contains compounds that can stimulate microbial activity in the worm bin. Beneficial microorganisms play a vital role in breaking down organic matter, releasing nutrients in forms that are more accessible to plants. Alfalfa meal is a potent source of nitrogen, an essential nutrient for plant growth, and when added to your worm bin, it provides an additional nutrient source for the worms and microorganisms involved in the decomposition process. Lastly, we add kelp meal. Kelp contains natural plant growth hormones such as gibberellins, auxins, and cytokinins, which can have positive effects on plant development. While the concentrations may not be extremely high, the presence of these hormones can contribute to overall plant health when using the vermicompost in your garden. Kelp meal is also a slow release organic amendment, but processing it through your worm bin can help speed up the process to give your plants the available potassium and nutrients. Now it's time to mix everything well and even. We're in the city, so we use filtered water from a carbon bottle to get rid of chlorine and chloramine present in tap water. If you don't have a filter, you can use tap water, but I recommend you leave it out for a day or two to off-gas the chlorine. Microbes do not like those chemicals. They're put in the water to discourage and remove microbial life, so try to avoid them. You can add moisture however you like, as long as the bedding is not sopping wet. We want just enough moisture to wring out one or two drops of water. We use drip trays under our systems so we can water the tray to allow an even absorption throughout the bottom of the bin. I also add a bit of water on top and then I mix it in. Once everything is nice and moist, it's time to add worms. This is a seven gallon container with roughly four gallons of material. I typically add about 250 to 300 composting worms. The more you add, the faster the material will break down. I just wouldn't start off with over 2,000 or two pounds of worms in this system. This is one of our systems that's been processing for roughly three months. I wanted to show you how we feed our worms our kitchen scraps. We start by digging out the center of the bed about four inches wide and six inches deep to just about the bottom. We then fill it with our food scraps, then we bury it. Reasons for concentrating all the food is to allow the worms areas to avoid any type of protein poisoning that can occur from overfeeding. In our bins, we leave about two pounds of food waste for around four months. And at that time, the material has basically disappeared. It's important to note that before harvest, you're going to want to wait till all the food material has been decomposed. For our lid, we like to use a thick layer of leaves. You can use any leaves really, they act as a good insulation layer, retaining moisture while also serving as a food source, once the system of course breaks down all their food scraps in the bedding. Overall, this is my favorite way to make the best castings I've ever produced. You're getting high fungal activity, available nutrients and minerals. It's also very low maintenance considering all you're doing for two to four months is monitoring moisture levels. And to add moisture, all you have to do is add it to the drip tray. No need to disturb your system or mix in any moisture. Harvests with this system can go from four months to over a year. You just have to keep adding food material and carbon to provide the system with everything it needs. And once of course it's filled to the top, you can harvest by screening material or using migration methods to evacuate all the worms and harvesting the castings that way. You are trying to create the most ideal environment for worms and microbes, just like nature. And you'll never have to buy worm castings ever again. 
We live in Texas, so our weather can be extreme on both ends. So all of our vermicompost systems are in a temperature controlled environment. You can keep them outdoors under heavy shade, but you're going to have to pay attention to the weather forecast because any extreme weather fluctuations in either direction, ranging from 48 degrees to 85 degrees Fahrenheit, can wipe out your entire worm population. So keeping them in a temperature controlled area is much more preferable and you'll have no issues with the weather affecting your worm system. If you liked or found this video cool or informational, let us know. We are a micro-organic gardening company in Austin, Texas. Check out our website. Most of the items in this video you can get from us. Try it out, let us know, and we'll be putting out much more content in the foreseeable future. Uh, are there any other topics you guys want to learn about? Let us know.